Ante Pavelic Croatian pronunciation NTE pilot listen the 14th of July 1889 to the 28th of December 1959 was a Croatian general and military dictator who founded and headed the fascist ultranationalist organization known as the Ustase in 1929 and governed the independent state of Croatia Croatian Nezavisna Drzava Hrvatska NDH a fascist Nazi puppet state built out of Yugoslavia by the authorities of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy from 19 1941–1945. Pavelic and the Eustace persecuted many racial minorities and political opponents in the NDH during the war, including Serbs, Jews, Romani, and anti-fascist Croats. At the start of his career, Pavelic was a lawyer and a politician of the Croatian Party of Rights in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia known for his nationalist beliefs and support for an independent Croatia. By the end of the 1920s, his political activity became more radical as he called on Croats to revolt against Yugoslavia, and schemed an Italian protectorate of Croatia separate from Yugoslavia. After King Alexander I declared his 6 January dictatorship in 1929 and banned all political parties, Pavelic went abroad and plotted with the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization to undermine the Yugoslav state, which prompted the Yugoslav authorities to try him in absentia and sentence him to death. In the meantime, Pavelic had moved to fascist Italy where he founded the Eustace, a Croatian nationalist movement with the goal of creating an independent Croatia by any means, including the use of terror. Pavelic incorporated terrorist actions in the Eustace program, such as train bombings and assassinations, staged a small uprising in Lika in 1932, culminating in the assassination of King Alexander in 1934 in conjunction with the IMRO. Pavelic was once again sentenced to death after being tried in France in absentia and, under international pressure, the Italians imprisoned him for 18 months, and largely obstructed the Eustace in the following period. At the behest of the Germans and Italians, senior Eustace Slavko Kvaternik declared the NDH's establishment in the name of Pavelic, the Poglavnik. Pavelic returned and took control of the puppet government, creating a political system similar to that of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. The NDH, though constituting a greater Croatia, was forced by the Italians to relinquish several territorial concessions to the latter. After taking control, Pavelic imposed largely anti-Serbian and anti-Semitic policies that resulted in the deaths of over 100,000 Serbs and Jews in concentration and extermination camps in the NDH, murdering and torturing several hundred thousand Serbs, along with tens of thousands of Jews and Roma. These persecutions and killings have been described as the single most disastrous episode in Yugoslav history." The racial policies of the NDH greatly contributed to their rapid loss of control over the occupied territory, as they fed the ranks of both the Chetniks and partisans and caused even the German authorities to attempt to restrain Pavelic and his genocidal campaign. In 1945, he ordered the executions of prominent NDH politicians Miladin Lorkovic and Anti Vokic on charges of treason when they were arrested for plotting to oust him and align the NDH with the Allies. Following the surrender of Germany in May 1945, Pavelic ordered his troops to keep fighting even after the surrender. The remainder of the NDH government decided to flee to Austria on 3 May 1945, but Pavelic instead ordered them to retreat to Austria over the former border of the Third Reich and have the Croatian armed forces surrender to the British army. The British refused to accept the surrender and directed them to surrender to the partisans. The partisans began carrying out massacres against the Eustace when the latter attacked their position, killing them in a series of repatriations later known as the Bleiburg repatriations. Pavelic himself fled to Austria, and later Argentina, whose president Juan Perón provided sanctuary for German war criminals and several Eustace. On 10 April 1957, he was shot several times in an assassination attempt by Serbian patriot Blagoj Jovovic. Pavelic survived the attempt and soon left Argentina for Spain. He died two and a half years later, on 28 December 1959, aged 70, from the injuries he sustained in the attempted assassination. <laughs> Early life <laughs> Birth and education 
Ante Pavelic was born in the Herzegovinian village of Bradina on the slopes of Ivan Mountain north of Konyach, roughly 15 kilometres southwest of Hadjici, then part of the Ottoman Empire occupied by Austrian-Hungarian Empire. His parents had moved to Bosnia and Herzegovina from the village of Krivi Put in the central part of the Velvet Plain, in southern Lika in today's Croatia, to work on the sarajevo metkovic railway line, searching for work. His family moved to the village of Jezero outside Jace where Pavelic attended primary school, Maktab. Here Pavelic learned Muslim traditions and lessons that influenced his attitude towards Bosnia and its Muslims. Pavelic also attended a Jesuit primary school in Travnik, growing up in a Muslim-majority city. Bosnian Muslim culture was later to become a major influence on his political views. Pavelic's sense of Croat nationalism grew from a visit to Lika with his parents where he heard townspeople speaking Croatian, and realized it was not just the language of peasants. While attending school in Travnik he became an adherent of the nationalist ideologies of Ante Starcevic and his successor as the leader of the Party of Rights, Josip Frank. Health problems interrupted his education for a short time in 1905. In summer he found job on the railway in Sarajevo and Visegrad. He continued his education in Zagreb, home city of his elder brother Josip. In Zagreb, Pavelic attended high school. His failure to complete his fourth-year classes meant he had to re-sit the exam. Early in his high school days, he joined the Pure Party of Rights as well as the Frankovci Students' Organization, founded by Josip Frank, father-in-law of Slavko Kvaternik, an Austro-Hungarian colonel. Later he attended high school in Senj at the Classical Gymnasium where he completed his fifth-year classes. Health problems again interrupted his education and he took a job on the road in Istria, near Buzit. In 1909 he finished his sixth year classes in Karlovac. His seventh year classes were completed in Senj. Pavelic graduated in Zagreb in 1910 and entered the law faculty of the University of Zagreb. In 1912 Pavelic was arrested on suspicion of involvement in the attempted assassination of the ban of Croatia Slavonia, Slavko Kuvaj. He completed his law degree in 1914, and obtained his doctorate in July 1915. From 1915 until 1918 he worked as a clerk in the office of Alexander Horvat, president of the Party of Rights. After completing his clerkship, he became a lawyer in Zagreb. <laughs> Political rise During World War I, Pavelic played an active role in the Party of Rights. As an employee and friend of its leader Horvat, he often attended important party meetings, taking over Horvat's duties when he was absent. In 1918, Pavelic entered the party leadership and its business committee. After the unification of the state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs with the Kingdom of Serbia on 1 December 1918, the Party of Rights held a day of public protest claiming that the Croatian people were against having a Serbian king, and that their highest state authorities had not agreed to unification. Further, the party expressed their wish for Croatian Republic in a program from March 1919, signed by President of the party, Vladimir Prebeg and Pavelic. By 1921 Pavelic was an elected city official in Zagreb and became a major influence on younger members. At the time he was the party secretary, and as a leader of the party he began to advocate Croatian independence. Pavelic was a member of the Frankovci faction of the Party of Rights. Ivica Persic, a Croatian politician from the competing Milanovci faction, wrote in his memoir how Pavelic's 1921 election significantly raised the standing of his law office in Zagreb. A number of rich Jewish clients paid him to obtain Yugoslav citizenship, and Pavelic subsequently started to make frequent visits to Belgrade, where he would procure those documents through his increasing number of connections to the members of the ruling People's Radical Party. In 1921, 14 Party of Rights members, including Pavelic, Ivo Pilar, and Milan Soufflé, were arrested for anti-Yugoslav activities, for their alleged contacts with the Croatian Committee, a Croatian nationalist organization that was based in Hungary at the time. Pavelic acted as the defense lawyer at the subsequent trial and was released. On 12 August 1922, in St. Mark's Church, Zagreb, Pavelic married Maria Lavrencevic. They had three children, daughters Vishnya and Mirjana and son Velimir. 
Maria was part Jewish through her mother's family and her father, Martin Lavrenchevich, was a member of the Party of Rights and a well-known journalist. Later Pavelic became vice president of the Croatian Bar Association, the professional body representing Croatian lawyers. In his speeches to the Yugoslav parliament, he opposed Serbian nationalism and spoke in favor of Croatian independence. He was active with the youth of the Croatian Party of Rights and began contributing to the Starčević and Kvaternik newspapers. Serbian members of the Yugoslav parliament disliked him, and when a Serbian member said, Good night to him in parliament, Pavelic responded, Gentlemen, I will be euphoric when I will be able to say to you, Good night. I will be happy when all Croats can say, Good night and thank you, for this party we had here with you. I think that you will all be happy when you don't have Croats here anymore." In 1927, Pavelic became the vice president of the party. In June 1927, Pavelic represented Zagreb County at the European Congress of Cities in Paris. When he was returning from Paris, he visited Rome and submitted a memorandum in the name of HSP to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in which he offered to cooperate with Italy in dismembering Yugoslavia. In order to obtain Italian support for Croatian independence, the memorandum effectively made any such Croatia little more than an Italian protectorate. The memorandum also stated that the Party of Rights recognized the existing territorial settlements between Italy and Yugoslavia, thus giving up all Croatian claims to Istria, Rijeka, Zadar and the Adriatic Islands Italy had annexed after World War I. These areas contained between 300,000 and 400,000 Croats. Further, the memorandum also agreed to cede the Bay of Kotor and Dalmatian headlands of strategic importance to Italy, and agreed that a future Croatia would not establish a navy. As the most radical politician of the Croatian bloc, Pavelic sought opportunities to internationalize the Croatian question and highlight Yugoslavia's unsustainability. In December 1927, Pavelic defended four Macedonian students in Skopje who were accused of belonging to the Macedonian Youth Secret Revolutionary Organization founded by Ivan Mihailov. During the trial, Pavelic accused the court of setting them up and stressed the right to self-determination. This trial received public attention in Bulgaria and Yugoslavia. Following his election as a member of the Croatian bloc in the 1927 election, Pavelic became his party's liaison with Nikola Pasic, the Yugoslav prime minister. He was one of two elected Croatian bloc candidates alongside Anti Trumbic, one of the key politicians in the creation of a Yugoslav state. From 1927 until 1929, he was part of the minuscule delegation of the Party of Rights in the Yugoslav parliament. In summer 1928, the leaders of the Croatian bloc, Trumbic and Pavelic, addressed the Italian consul in Zagreb to gain support for the Croatian struggle against regime of King Alexander. On 14 the July, they received a positive response, after which Pavelic maintained contact. After the assassination of Croatian politicians in the National Assembly, of which he was an eyewitness, Pavelic joined the Peasant Democratic Coalition and started to publish a magazine called Hrvatski Domobran, in which he advocated Croatian independence. His political party radicalized after the assassination. He found support in the Croatian Rights Republican Youth Hrvatska Pravaska Republikanska Omladina, a youth wing of the Party of Rights led by Bronimir Jelic. On 1 October 1928 he founded an armed group with the same name, an act through which he openly called on Croatians to revolt. This group trained as part of a legal sports society. Yugoslav authorities declared the organization illegal and banned its activities. In exile Pavelic held the position of the Party of Rights Secretary until 1929, the beginning of the 6 January dictatorship in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. According to Croatian historian Hervoje Matkovic, after the king declared his dictatorship Pavelic's house was under constant police watch, at this time, Pavelic started to organize the Ustasa, Ustasa Hrvatski Revolutionarni Pokret as an organization with military and conspiratorial principles. Its official foundation was 7 January 1929. The Ustasa movement was "...founded on the principles of racialism and intolerance." Because of the threat of arrest, Pavelic escaped during a surveillance lapse and went to Austria on the night of 1920 January 1929. According to Tomasevich, Pavelic left for Vienna to seek medical aid. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Initial exile and trial. 
He contacted other Croatian emigrants, mainly political emigres, former Austrian-Hungarian officers, who gathered around Stjepan Sarkotic and refused to return to Yugoslavia. After a short stay in Austria, alongside Gustav Persets, Pavelic moved to Budapest. In March 1929, the Ustase commenced a campaign of terrorism within Yugoslavia with the assassination of Tony Schlegel in Zagreb. Schlegel was a pro-Yugoslav editor of the newspaper Novosti who was also a close confidant of King Alexander. After establishing contact with the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization in April 1929, he and Persets went to Sofia in Bulgaria. On 29 April 1929, Pavelic and Ivan Mihailov signed the Sofia Declaration in which they formalized cooperation between their movements. In the declaration, they obligated themselves to separate Croatia and Macedonia from Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia protested to Bulgaria. Pavelic was found guilty of high treason and sentenced to death in absentia along with Persets on 17 August 1929. Because of the Yugoslav verdict, on 25 September 1929 Pavelic was arrested in Vienna and expelled to Germany. Pavelic's stay in Germany was constrained by opposition from the German ambassador to Yugoslavia, Adolf Koster, a supporter of Yugoslavia. A friend of King Alexander, he did his best to prevent Croatian nationalist activity in Yugoslavia. Topic. Exile in Italy Pavelic left Germany under a false passport and went to Italy, where his family already lived. In Italy he frequently changed location and lived under false names, most often as Antonio Serder. Since he had been in contact with Italian authorities since 1927, he easily established contact with the fascists. In autumn 1929 he established contacts with Italian journalists and Mussolini's brother Arnaldo, who supported Croatian independence without any territorial concession. Pavelic created sympathy and understanding of Croats among Italians. That autumn Pavelic published a brochure called Establishment of the Croatian State, Lasting Peace in the Balkans which summarized important events of Croatian history. The Italian authorities did not want to formally support Eustace or Pavelic, to protect their reputation, nevertheless, the group received support from Benito Mussolini, who saw them as a means to help destroy Yugoslavia and expand Italian influence in the Adriatic. Mussolini allowed Pavelic to live in exile in Rome and train his paramilitaries for war with Yugoslavia. In the Eustace organization of 1929, 1930, Pavelic's closest associates were Persets, Jelic, Ivan Persevic, and later Miladin Lorkovic and Mile Budak. The Eustace began with the creation of military formations trained for sabotage and terrorism. With financial help from Mussolini, in 1931 Pavelic established terrorist training camps, first in Bovegno in the Brescia region, and encouraged the foundation of such camps all around Italy. Camps were founded in Borgataro, Lepari, and Janka Pusta in Hungary. The Eustace were involved with smuggling weapons and propaganda into Yugoslavia from their camps in Italy and Hungary. At the demands of Italian authorities, the camps were often moved. The main Eustace headquarters was at first in Tornio, and later in Bologna. On Pavelic's initiative, his associates established Eustace associations in Belgium, Netherlands, France, Germany, Argentina, Uruguay, Bolivia, Brazil and North America. Pavelic also encouraged publishing magazines in various countries. The series of bombings and shootings by the Eustace in Yugoslavia resulted in a severe crackdown on political activity as the state met terror with terror. Impoverished Croat peasants were hardest hit by the counter terror, usually meted out by Serb policemen. In 1932, he started a newspaper named the Eustace Herald of Croatian Revolutionaries. Croatian, Eustace Vjesnik Hrvatski Revolutionaraka. From its very first publication, Pavelic announced that the use of violence was central to the Eustace. The dagger, revolver, machine gun and time bomb, these are the bells that will announce the dawn and the resurrection of the independent state of Croatia. According to Ivo Goldstein, there were no instances of antisemitism in the newspaper in the beginning. Goldstein suggests there were three reasons for this, the total focus of the Eustace on the Belgrade government, lack of the necessary intellectual capacity within the early Eustace movement to properly develop their ideology, and the active involvement of Jews with the Eustace. 
Goldstein points out that as Eustace's ideology developed in later years, it became more anti Semitic. At a meeting held in Spittal in Austria in 1932, Pavelic, Persets, and Vekoslav Servitsi decided to start a small uprising. It began at midnight on 6 September 1932 and was known as the Velvet Uprising. Led by Andrea Artukovic, the insurgency involved around 20 Eustace members armed with Italian equipment. They attacked a police station and half an hour later pulled back to Velbit with no casualties. This uprising was to scare Yugoslav authorities. Despite the small scale the Yugoslav authorities were unnerved because the power of the Eustace had been unknown. As a result, major security measures were introduced. This action appeared in the foreign press, especially in Italy and Hungary, on the 1st of June 1933 and the 16th of April 1941. The Eustace program and the 17 principles of the Eustace movement were published in Zagreb by the propaganda department of the Supreme Eustace headquarters. The main goal was the creation of an independent Croatian state based on its historical and ethnic areas, with Pavelic stating that Eustace must pursue this end by any means necessary, even by force of arms. According to his rules he would organize actions, assassinations and diversions. With this document the organization changed its name from Eustace Croatian Revolutionary Movement to Eustace Croatian Revolutionary Organization Croatian Eustace Hrvatska Revolutionarna Organizacija abbreviated to UHRO Topic <laughs> Assassination of King Alexander and Aftermath By killing the king of Yugoslavia, Pavelic saw an opportunity to cause riots in Yugoslavia and eventual collapse of the state. In December 1933, Pavelic ordered the assassination of King Alexander. The assassin was caught by the police and the assassination attempt failed. However, Pavelic tried again in October 1934 in Marseille. On the 9th of October 1934, King Alexander I of Yugoslavia and French Foreign Minister Louis Barthou were assassinated in Marseille. The perpetrator Vlado Chernozemsky, a Bulgarian revolutionary, was killed right after the assassination by French police. Three Eustace members, who had been waiting at different locations for the king, were captured and sentenced to life imprisonment by a French court. Pavelic along with Eugen Kvaternik and Ivan Persevic were subsequently sentenced to death in absentia by a French court. That the security was lax even though one attempt had already been made on Alexander's life testified to Pavelic's organizational abilities, he had apparently been able to bribe a high official in the Sûreté General. The Marseille prefect of police, Juhano, was subsequently removed from office. The Eustace believed that the assassination of King Alexander had effectively broken the backbone of Yugoslavia, and that it was their most important achievement. Under pressure from France, the Italian police arrested Pavelic and several Eustace emigrants on 17 October 1934. Pavelic was imprisoned in Turin and released in March 1936. After he met with Eugen Dido Kvaternik on Christmas 1934 in prison, he stated that assassination was the only language Serbs understand. During his time in prison, Pavelic was informed about the situation in Yugoslavia and the 5 May 1935 election when the coalition led by Croat Vladko Masic won. He stated that his victory was aided by the activity of Eustace. By the mid-1930s, graffiti with the initials ZEP meaning, Long live Ante Pavelic, Croatian, Zivio Ante Pavelic had begun to appear on the streets of Zagreb. After Pavelic's released from prison, he remained under surveillance by the Italian authorities, and his Eustace were interned. Disappointed with relations between the Italians and the Eustace organization, Pavelic became closer to Nazi Germany, who promised to change the map of Europe fixed under the 1919 Treaty of Versailles. In October 1936 he finished a survey for the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs called the Croatian Question Croatian, Hrvatsko Pitanje, German, Die Krotisch Fraj. According to Ivo Goldstein, the survey deemed the Serbian state authorities, international Freemasonry, Jews and communism as enemies and stated that today almost all banking and almost all trade in Croatia is in the hands of the Jews. This became possible only because the state gave them privileges, because the government believed that this would weaken Croatian national strength. 
The Jews greeted the foundation of the so-called Yugoslav state with great enthusiasm because a national Croatian state would never suit them as well as Yugoslavia did. All the press in Croatia is in Jewish hands. This Jewish Freemason press is constantly attacking Germany, the German people and National Socialism." According to Matkovic, after 1937 Pavelic paid more attention to the Ustase in Yugoslavia than elsewhere, since the emigrants had become passive after the assassination. In 1938 he instructed the Ustase to form stations in Yugoslav towns. The fall of Stojadinovic's government and the creation of the Bonavina of Croatia in 1939 further increased Ustase activity, they founded Uzdanika Hope, a savings cooperative. Under Uzdanika, Ustase founded Ustase University headquarters and the illegal association Matija Gubic. However, Pavlovich observes that Pavelic had few contacts with the Ustase within Yugoslavia, and that his esteemed position within the Ustase was partly due to his isolation in Italy. In the late 1930s, about half of the 500 Ustasa in Italy were voluntarily repatriated to Yugoslavia, went underground, and increased their activities. On 1 April 1937, after the Stojadinovic Ciano Agreement, all Ustase units were dissolved by the Italian government. After that, Pavelic was put under house arrest in Siena, where he lived until 1939. During this period he penned his anti-Bolshevik work Horrors and Mistakes Italian, Errori e Orori, Croatian, Strahote Zabluda which was published in 1938. It was immediately seized by the authorities. At the onset of World War II he moved to a villa near Florence under police watch until spring 1941, after Italy occupied Albania and prepared an attack on Yugoslavia, Ciano invited Pavelic to negotiations. They discussed Croatian armed revolt, Italian military intervention and the creation of a Croatian state with monetary, customs and personal unions with Italy, which Pavelic later refused. In 1940 Pavelic negotiated with the Italians for military assistance in creating a separate Croatian state which would have had strong ties to Italy, but this plan was postponed by the invasion of France, and subsequently derailed by Adolf Hitler. Eustace regime Establishment On 25 March 1941, Yugoslavia signed the Tripartite Pact, but two days later the government was overthrown in a bloodless military coup by opponents who were motivated by a range of factors. Two days after the Belgrade coup, Mussolini invited Pavelic from Florence to his private residence in Rome, the Villa Torlonia. This was their first meeting since Pavelic's arrival in Italy. Pavelic was escorted by Mattia Bzik, but Mussolini received only Pavelic. Acting Foreign Minister Filippo Anfuso was present during the meeting. Pavelic and Mussolini discussed Croatia's position after Yugoslav capitulation. Mussolini was concerned that Italian designs on Dalmatia be achieved, and in response, Pavelic acknowledged the agreements he had made earlier and reassured him. Pavelic requested the release of the remaining interned Eustace, an Italian liaison officer was allocated to him, and the Italians also lent him a radio station in Florence so he could conduct late evening broadcasts. On 1 April 1941 Pavelic called for the liberation of Croatia, on 6 April 1941 the Axis invaded Yugoslavia from multiple directions, rapidly overwhelming the under-prepared Royal Yugoslav Army which capitulated 11 days later. The German operational plan included making political promises to the Croats to increase internal discord. The Germans wanted popular support for any government they appointed for a new Croatian puppet state, so that they could control their zone of occupation with minimal forces and exploit the available resources peacefully. The administration of Bonavina Croatia had been under the control of an alliance of Vladko Masic's Croatian Peasant Party and the mostly Croatian Serb Independent Democratic Party. Masic was very popular among Croats, had been vice premier in the Yugoslav Kvetkovic government, was a supporter of Yugoslav accession to the Axis, and had a ready made paramilitary force in the form of the Croatian Peasant Party Croatian Peasant Defense. As a result, the Germans attempted to get Masic to proclaim an independent Croatian state and form a government. When he refused to cooperate, the Germans decided they had no alternative other than to support Pavelic, even though they considered that the Eustace could not provide an assurance they could govern in the way the Germans wanted. 
It was estimated by the Germans that Pavelic had around 900 sworn Ustase in Yugoslavia at the time of the invasion, and the Ustase themselves considered that their supporters only numbered some 40,000. The Germans also considered Pavelic to be an Italian agent or Mussolini's man but considered that other senior Ustases such as deputy leader Croatian, Doglavnik Slavko Kvaternik were sufficiently pro-German to ensure their interests would be supported by any regime led by Pavelic. On 10 April 1941, Kvaternik declared an independent state of Croatia in the name of the Poglavnik Ante Pavelic via the Zagreb radio station. Kvaternik was acting on the orders of SS Brigadefuhrer Brigadier Edmund Wiesenmeyer. The proclamation was viewed favorably by a significant portion of the population, particularly those living in Zagreb, western Herzegovina and Lika. The Croatian peasant defense, which had been infiltrated by the Ustase, assisted by disarming Royal Yugoslav Army units and imposing some control, the Ustase that had been interned in Italy had been concentrated at Pistoia, about 50 kilometers from Florence where they were issued with Italian uniforms and small arms. They were joined by Pavelic on 10 April and listened to radio broadcasts announcing the proclamation of the NDH. Pavelic's visit to Pistoia was actually his first meeting with the Eustace after the assassination in Marseille. In Pistoia, Pavelic gave a speech in which he announced that their struggle for an independent Croatia was near the end. After that he returned to his home in Florence where he heard Kvaternik's proclamation on a radio broadcast from Vienna. On the 11th of April, Pavelic went to Rome, where he was hosted by Anfuso, after which he was received by Mussolini. During the meeting Pavelic was guaranteed that his government would be recognized immediately after he arrived in Zagreb. After a meeting in Rome, Pavelic boarded the train with his Eustace escort and went to Zagreb via Trieste and Rijeka. He arrived at Karlovac on 13 April with about 250, 400 Eustace where was greeted by Wiesenmeyer who was appointed by German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop to supervise the state's creation. In Karlovac, Pavelic was asked to confirm that he had not made any commitments to the Italians, but Mussolini's envoy arrived while he was there and negotiations ensued to ensure that his messages to Hitler and Mussolini would deal satisfactorily with the questions of Dalmatia and recognition by the Axis powers. This issue was the first sign of Italo-German tensions over the NDH. Diplomatic recognition of the NDH by the Axis was delayed to ensure that Pavelic made the promised territorial concessions to Italy. These concessions meant that Pavelic handed to Italy some 5,400 square kilometers of territory with a population of 380,000, consisting of about 280,000 Croats, 90,000 Serbs, 5,000 Italians and 5,000 others. Once this was completed Pavelic travelled to Zagreb on 15 April, and Axis recognition was also granted to the NDH on that day. On 16 April 1941, Pavelic signed a decree appointing the new Croatian state government. He was the first to take an oath, after which he stated, since 1102, Croatian people didn't have its autonomous and independent state. And there, after full 839 years, the time has come to form the responsible Croatian government. Pavelic thus presented the NDH as the embodiment of the historical aspirations of the Croatian people. The decree named Osman Kulinovic as the vice president of the government, and Slavko Kvaternik as Pavelic's deputy, and appointed eight other senior Eustace as ministers. The Eustace made use of the existing bureaucracy of the Bonavina of Croatia, after it had been purged and Eusticized. The new regime drew upon the concept of an uninterrupted Croatian state since the arrival of the Croats in their contemporary homeland, and reflected extreme Croat nationalism mixed with Nazism and Italian fascism, Catholic clerical authoritarianism and the peasantism of the Croatian Peasant Party. Pavelic tried to prolong the negotiations with Italy about the boundary between the two states. At the time, he was receiving support from Berlin. Chiano insisted that Italy must annex the whole Croatian littoral, and after some time the Germans pulled back to protect German-Italian relations. On 25 April, Pavelic and Chiano met in Ljubljana again discussing borders. Chiano's first proposal was Italian annexation of the whole Croatian littoral and hinterland all the way to Karlovac. Another proposal was somewhat less demanding but with closer ties with Italy, including a monetary, customs and personal union. Pavelic refused and instead demanded that Croatian gain the towns of Trogir, Split and Dubrovnik. Chiano didn't respond, but promised another meeting. Pavelic was still counting on German support, but without success. 
On 7 May 1941, Pavelic and Mussolini met in Terzic and agreed to discuss the matter in Rome. On 18 May 1941 Pavelic went to Rome with his delegation and signed a Treaty of Rome in which Croatia gave up part of Dalmatia, Krk, Rab, Korčula, Biograd, Šibenik, Split, Chovo, Solta, Mljet and parts of Kanavla and the Bay of Kotor to Italy. A Croatian proposal that Split and Korčula Island be jointly administrated was ignored. These annexations shocked the people and led to the only public demonstration recorded in the independent state of Croatia's history. Hundreds of citizens, members of the Eustace movement and the Domobranstvo army protested on the 25th of December 1941. Pavelic tried to retrieve the lost areas, but kept his real feelings and those of the people from the Italians to maintain the pretext of good relations. Moreover, Pavelic agreed to name Prince Amini, Duke of Aosta as King of Croatia to avoid a union with Italy, but Pavelic delayed the formalities in the hope of gaining more territory in return for accepting the new king. However, Amini declined and never ruled the Croatian state. Communist propaganda attacked Pavelic over the Italian annexations. On 10 July 1941, Pavelic accepted the annexation of Metamerje by Hungary. Legislation On 14 April 1941, in one of his first acts after assuming power, Pavelic signed the Decree Law Concerning the Preservation of Croatian National Property, which annulled all large property transactions made by Jews in the two months prior to the proclamation of the NDH. He signed the Law Decree on Protection of the Nation and the State on 17 April 1941, which came into effect immediately, was retrospective, and imposed the death penalty for any actions causing harm to the honor or vital interests of the NDH. This law was the first of three decrees that effectively placed the Serb, Jewish and Roma populations of the NDH outside the law and lead to their persecution and destruction. On April 19 and 22, the Eustachy issued decrees suspending all employees of state and local governments, and state enterprises. This allowed the new regime to get rid of all unwanted employees. In principle this meant all Jews, Serbs and all Yugoslav-oriented Croats. On 25 April 1941, he signed into law a decree prohibiting the use of the Cyrillic alphabet, which directly impacted on the Serbian Orthodox population of the NDH, as the rites of the Church were written in Cyrillic. On 30 April 1941, Pavelic enacted the Law Concerning Nationality, which essentially made all Jews non citizens, and this was followed by further laws restricting their movement and residency. From 23 May all Jews were required to wear yellow identification tags, and on 26 June Pavelic issued a decree which blamed Jews for activities against the NDH and ordered their internment in concentration camps. Poglavnik As Poglavnik of the NDH, Pavelic had full control over the state. The oath taken by all government employees declared that Pavelic represented the sovereignty of the NDH. His title Poglavnik represented the close ties between the Croatian state and the Eustace movement, since he had the same title as leader of the Eustace. Moreover, Pavelic made all significant decisions, including naming state ministers and leaders of the Eustace. As the NDH had no functional legislature, Pavelic approved all of the laws, which made him the most powerful person in the state. Through the incorporation of the extreme right wing of the popular HSS, Pavelic's regime was initially accepted by the majority of Croats in the NDH. The regime also attempted to rewrite history by falsely claiming the legacy of the founder of the HSS Stjepan Radic, and that of Croatian nationalist Ante Starcevic. Soon afterwards, Pavelic visited Pope Pius XII in May 1941, attempting to win Vatican recognition, but failed, although the papacy placed an ambassador in Zagreb. The Vatican maintained relations with the Yugoslav government in exile. On 9 June 1941, Pavelic visited Adolf Hitler at the Berghof. Hitler impressed on Pavelic that he should maintain a policy of national intolerance for 50 years. Hitler also encouraged Pavelic to accept Slovenian immigrants and deport Serbs to the territory of the military commander in Serbia. Over the next few months, the Eustace deported around 120,000 Serbs. In July 1941, the German plenipotentiary general in the NDH, Edmund Glez von Horstenau, met with Pavelic to express his grave concern over the excesses of the Eustace. 
This was the first of many occasions over the next three years during which von Horstenau and Pavelic clashed over the conduct of the Eustace. By the end of 1941, the acceptance of the Eustace regime by most Croats had been transformed into disappointment and discontent, and as a result of the terror perpetrated by the regime some pro-Yugoslav sentiment was beginning to re-emerge, along with pro-communist feelings. The discontent was made worse when Pavelic had Vladko Masic arrested and sent to Jasonovic concentration camp in October 1941. By the end of 1941 HSS propaganda leaflets were urging peasants to be patient as the day of liberation is near. In the public arena there were efforts to create a cult of personality around Pavelic. These efforts included the imposition of a Nazi-style salute, emphasizing that he had been sentenced to death in absentia by a Yugoslav court, and repeatedly claiming that he had undergone great hardship to achieve the independence of the NDH. Pavelic summoned the Sabor on 24 January 1942. It met between 23 and 28 February, but it had little influence and after December 1942 was never called again. On 3 March 1942, Hitler awarded Pavelic the Grand Cross of the Order of the German Eagle. Siegfried Kasch, the German envoy, handed it to him in Zagreb. Eugen Dido Kvaternik, son of Slavko Kvaternik, and one of the main protagonists in the Eustace genocide of the Serbs stated that Pavelic directed Croat nationalism against the Serbs in order to distract the Croat population from a potential backlash against the Italians over his territorial concessions to them in Dalmatia. The worst policies directed against minorities were Eustace-run concentration and forced labor camps. The most notorious camp was the Jasonovic concentration camp, where 80,000 to 100,000 people died, including around 18,000 Croatian Jews, or around 90% of the pre-World War II Jewish community. Pavelic founded the Croatian Orthodox Church with the aim of pacifying the Serbs. However, the underlying ideology behind the creation of the Croatian Orthodox Church was connected to the ideas of Ante Starcevic, who considered that Serbs were Orthodox Croats and reflected a desire to create a Croatian state comprising three main religious groupings, Roman Catholic, Muslim and Croatian Orthodox. There is some evidence that the status of Sarajevo Serbs improved after they joined the Croatian Orthodox Church in significant numbers. Through both forcible and voluntary conversions between 1941 and 1945, 244,000 Serbs were converted to Catholicism. In June 1942, Pavelic met with General Roata and they agreed that Eustace administration could be returned to Zone 3 except in towns with Italian garrisons. Pavelic agreed to the continued presence of the Chetnik Anti Communist Volunteer Militia in this zone, and that the Italians would intervene in Zone 3 if they considered that was necessary. The result of this agreement was that Italian forces largely withdrew from areas that the NDH had virtually no presence and no means by which to reimpose their authority. This created a wide no-man's land from the Sanzic to western Bosnia in which the Chetniks and partisans could operate. By mid-1942, Pavelic's regime effectively controlled only the Zagreb region along with some larger towns that were home to strong NDH and German garrisons. Pavelic loyalists, mainly Eustace, wanted to fight the communist-led partisans while others, unnerved by the idea of a new Yugoslavia, also supported him. In 1941–42, the majority of partisans in Croatia were Serbs, but by October 1943 the majority were Croats. This change was partly due to the decision of a key Croatian peasant party member, Bozidar Magovac, to join the partisans in June 1943, and partly due to the capitulation of Italy, Pavelic and his government devoted attention to culture. Although most literature was propaganda, many books did not have an ideological basis, which allowed Croatian culture to flourish. The Croatian National Theatre received many world-famous actors as visitors. The major cultural milestone was the publication of the Croatian Encyclopedia, a work later outlawed under the communist regime. In 1941, the Croatian Football Association joined FIFA. On the 16th of December 1941, Pavelic met with Italian Foreign Minister Ciano in Venice and advised him that there were no more than 12,000 Jews left in the NDH. In the second half of 1942, the Wehrmacht commander in chief of the Southeast, General Oberst Alexander Lohr and Glez, urged Hitler to have Pavelic remove both the incompetent Slavko Kvaternik and his son, the bloodthirsty Eugen Dido. Kvaternik from power. When Pavelic visited Hitler in the Ukraine in September 1942, he agreed. 
The following month Slavko Kvaternik was allowed to retire to Slovakia, and Eugen went with him. Pavelic then used the Kvaterniks as scapegoats for both the terror of 1941–42 and the failure of NDH forces to impose law and order within the state. In January 1943, Glez told Pavelic that it would be better for everyone if all concentration camps in the NDH were closed and their inmates sent to work in Germany. Lohr also tried to get Hitler to remove Pavelic, disband the Eustace and appoint Glez as plenipotentiary general with supreme authority over the territory of the NDH. By March Hitler had decided to give the task of pacifying the NDH to the Reichsfuhrer SS Field Marshal Heinrich Himmler, who appointed his own plenipotentiary, Generalleutnant der Polizei Major General of Police Konstantin Kammerhofer. Kammerhofer brought the 7th SS Volunteer Mountain Division Prinz Eugen to the NDH and established a 20,000-strong German gendarmerie with a corps of 6,000 Volksdeutsch reinforced by Croats taken from the NDH Home Guard and police. This new gendarmerie swore allegiance to Hitler, not Pavelic. Shortly before the Italian capitulation, Pavelic appointed a new government led by Nikola Mandic as Prime Minister, which included Miroslav Navratil as Minister of the Armed Forces. Navratil was suggested by Glez, and was appointed by Pavelic to placate the Germans. As a direct result, the 170,000 strong armed forces of the NDH were reorganized under German control into smaller units with greater mobility, and the size of the Eustace militia was also increased to 45,000. In September 1944, Pavelic met with Hitler for the last time. Pavelic requested that the Germans stop arming and supplying Chetnik units, and asked that the Germans disarm the Chetniks or allow the NDH to disarm them. Hitler agreed that the Chetniks could not be trusted, and issued orders to German forces to stop cooperating with the Chetniks and assist NDH authorities to disarm them. However, German commanders were given sufficient leeway that they were able to avoid carrying out the orders. After the Italian capitulation As soon as the Italians capitulated in September 1943, Pavelic was quick to amalgamate Italian annexed Dalmatia into the NDH, renounce the offer of the Crown to the House of Savoy, and offer an amnesty to Croats that had joined the rebels. However, the Germans occupied the previously Italian occupied zone themselves, including the mines and key agricultural areas. By November 1943, Pavelic and his regime controlled little of the territory of the NDH, and by March 1944 SS Brigadefuhrer und Generalmajor der Waffen SS Brigadier Ernst Fick observed that, "...in terms of power, Dr. Ante Pavelic is only mayor of the city of Zagreb, excluding the suburbs." One of the key events in the history of the independent state of Croatia was the lorkovic vokic coup of 1944. Minister Miladin Lorkovic and army officer Andy Vokic suggested a plan whereby Croatia would change sides in the war and Pavelic would no longer be head of state in accordance with British demands. At first, Pavelic supported their ideas but changed his mind following a visit from a local Gestapo officer who told him that Germany would win the war with new weapons under development. Pavelic arrested Lorkovic and Vokic along with others involved in the coup, some representatives of the Croatian Peasant Party and a number of Domobran officers. Lorkovic and Vokic were shot at the end of April 1945 in the Lepaglava prison. After plans for an Anglo-American coup were discovered, from September 1944 until February 1945 Pavelic negotiated with the Soviet Union. The Soviets agreed to recognize the Croatian state on condition that the Red Army had free access and communists were allowed free reign. Pavelic refused their proposal and remained allied with Nazi Germany until the end of the war. Topic. Genocide As leader of the independent state of Croatia, Pavelic was the main instigator of the genocidal crimes committed in the NDH, and was responsible for a campaign of terror against Serbs, Jews, Roma and anti-Axis Croats and Bosniaks which included a network of concentration camps. Numerous testimonies from the Nuremberg trials along with records in German, Italian and Austrian war archives bear witness to atrocities perpetrated against the civilian population in terms of the proportion of the state population killed by its own government. The Pavelic regime was the most murderous in Europe after Hitler's Germany and outside of Europe has only been exceeded by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and some extremely genocidal African states. 
As the main instigator of the genocide, Pavelic was supported by his closest associate Eugen Dido Kvaternik and Minister of Interior Andrea Artukovic, who were responsible for planning and organization, and Vekoslav Luburic, who executed the orders. In late April 1941, Pavelic was interviewed by an Italian journalist, Alfio Russo. Pavelic stated that Serb rebels would be killed. In response, Russo asked him, What if all Serbs rebel? Pavelic answered, We shall kill them all. Around this time the first mass atrocities occurred, the Gudovac, Velgin and Glina massacres, which were committed by groups of Eustace under the direct command of Luburic. Serbian, Jewish, and Gypsy men, women, and children were literally hacked to death. Whole villages were razed and people driven into barns which the Eustace then set on fire. General Edmund von Glez Horstenau reported to the German Army Command OKW on 28 June 1941. According to reliable reports from countless German military and civil observers during the last few weeks the Eustace have gone raving mad. On 10 July, General Glez Horstenau added, Our troops have to be mute witnesses of such events, it does not reflect well on their otherwise high reputation. I am frequently told that German occupation troops would finally have to intervene against Eustace crimes. This may happen eventually. Right now, with the available forces, I could not ask for such action. Ad hoc intervention in individual cases could make the German army look responsible for countless crimes which it could not prevent in the past. A report to Gestapo chief Heinrich Himmler, dated 17 February 1942 on increased partisan activities stated that increased activity of the bands is chiefly due to atrocities carried out by Eustace units in Croatia against the Orthodox population. The Eustace committed their deeds not only against males of conscript age, but especially against helpless old people, women and children, between 172,000 and 290,000 Serbs, 31,000 of the 40,000 Jews, and almost all of the 25,000, 40,000 Roma were killed in the independent state of Croatia by the Eustace and their Axis allies. Both Jews and Gypsies were subject to a policy of total annihilation. According to an official Yugoslav report, only 1,500 out of 30,000 Croatian Jews remained alive at the end of World War II. Approximately 26,000 Gypsies were murdered of approximately 40,000 residents. Some 26,000 Croatian anti-fascists partisans, political opponents and civilians were also killed by the NDH regime, including an estimated 5,000 to 12,000 Croat anti-fascists and other dissidents that were killed at the Jasonovic concentration camp alone. <laughs> End of the NDH Seeing Germany's collapse and aware that the Croatian army could not resist the communists, Pavelic started a move of his forces to Austria, causing several groups of tens of thousands of Croatian soldiers as well as civilians to start a major northward march without a clear strategy. Pavelic left the country on 6 May 1945, and on 8 May, he convened a final meeting of the NDH government in Rogaska Slatina. At the meeting, General Alexander Lohr informed the government of Germany's capitulation and handed command of the NDH forces to Pavelic. Pavelic subsequently named General Vekoslav Luburic commander. Later that day Pavelic's convoy passed into the Soviet occupation zone in Austria, separate from the rest of the NDH government which went to the British occupation zone. The group made it into the American occupation zone and by 18 May arrived at the village of Leingreth near Radstadt where Pavelic's wife Mara and their two daughters had been living after leaving the NDH in December 1944. On May 8, Pavelic ordered that the columns from NDH continue to Austria, and that they refuse to surrender to the advancing communists, instead planning to surrender to the British. However, they were instead turned back in the mid-May Bleiburg repatriations, and many were subsequently killed by the partisans. The sheer number of civilians slowed down the retreat, made the surrender unfeasible to the Allies, and ultimately led to the belief that they were nothing more than a human shield to the Eustachy. For his abandonment of Croatian soldiers and civilians, later Croatian emigrants would accuse Pavelic of cowardice. The Pavelic family afterwards lived in the American occupation zone. Although Pavelic reported himself to American intelligence, neither they nor their British counterparts arrested him. Several members of the NDH government were executed after a one day trial in Zagreb on 6 June. Shortly after this, Pavelic moved to the village of Tiefbrunau closer to Salzburg. 
In September, American officials, believing the family were refugees and unaware of their identity, resettled them in the village of St. Gilgen. After St. Gilgen, Pavelic stayed with the family of a pre-war Macedonian revolutionary for several weeks before settling in Abertrum. Pavelic stayed there until April 1946. Topic: <laughs> Post-war. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Italy. He entered Italy disguised as a priest with a Peruvian passport. Passing Venice and Florence, he arrived in Rome in the spring of 1946 disguised as a Catholic priest and using the name Don Pedro Goner. On arrival in Rome he was given shelter by the Vatican and stayed at a number of residences that belonged to the Vatican while in Rome where he started to gather his associates. Pavelic formed the Croatian State Committee Croatian, Hrvatski Javni Odbor headed by Lavro Susic, Mate Ferkovic and Bositor Kavran. Tito and his new communist government accused the Catholic Church of harboring Pavelic who they stated, along with the Anglo-American imperialists, wanted to revive Nazism and take over communist Eastern Europe. The Yugoslav press claimed that Pavelic had stayed at the papal summer residence at Castel Gondolfo, while CIA information states that he stayed at a monastery near the papal residence in the summer and autumn of 1948. In fact, Anglo-American intelligence used former fascists and Nazis, as agents against the communists. For some time, Pavelic hid in a Jesuit house near Naples. In the autumn of 1948 he met Kronislav Draganovic, a Roman Catholic priest, who helped him obtain a Red Cross passport in the Hungarian name of Paul Aranyos. Draganovic allegedly planned to deliver Pavelic to the Italian police, but Pavelic avoided capture and fled to Argentina. <laughs> Argentina, Chile and attempted assassination Pavelic arrived in Buenos Aires on 6 November 1948 on the Italian merchant ship Sestriere, where he initially lived with the former Eustasa and writer Vinko Nikolic. In Buenos Aires Pavelic was joined by his son Velimir and daughter Mirjana. Soon afterwards, his wife Maria and older daughter Vishnya also arrived. Pavelic took up employment as a security advisor to Argentinian President Juan Perón. Pavelic's arrival documents show the assumed name of Pablo Aranos, which he continued to use. In 1950 Pavelic was given amnesty and allowed to stay in Argentina along with 34,000 other Croats, including former Nazi collaborators and those who had fled from the Allied advance. Following this, Pavelic reverted to his earlier pseudonym Antonio Cerder and continued to live in Buenos Aires. As for most other political immigrants in Argentina, life was hard and he had to work as a bricklayer. His best contact with the Perons was another former Eustace Branco Benzin, who enjoyed good relations with Evita Peron, wife of the president. Benzin had briefly been the Croatian ambassador to Germany during World War II and had known Hitler personally, which benefited Croatian-German relations. Thanks to Benzin's friendship with Evita Peron, Pavelic became the owner of an influential building company. Not long after arriving he joined the Eustace-related Croatian Home Guard. Croatian, Hrvatski Domobran organization. At the end of the 1940s, many former Ustas split from Pavelic because they believed that Croats, now under new circumstances, needed new political direction. Many who split from Pavelic continued to call themselves Ustas and sought the revival of the independent state of Croatia. The most well-known of these separatists was the former Ustase officer and head of the NDH concentration and extermination camp network, Vekislav Luburic, who lived in Spain. In Argentina, Pavelic used the Croatian Home Guard to gather Croatian political emigrants. Pavelic tried to expand the activities of this organization, and in 1950 founded the Croatian Statehood Party, which ceased to exist that year. On 10 April 1951, on the 10th anniversary of the independent state of Croatia, Pavelic announced the Croatia state government. This new government considered itself to be a government in exile. Other Eustace emigrants continued to arrive in Argentina, and they united under Pavelic's leadership, increasing their political activities. 
Pavelic himself remained politically active, publishing various statements, articles, and speeches that attacked the Yugoslav communist regime for promoting Serbian hegemony. In 1954, Pavelic met with Milan Stojadinovic, a former royal Yugoslav prime minister, who also lived in Buenos Aires. The subject of their meeting was trying to find solution for the historic conciliation between the Serbs and Croats. The meeting stirred controversy, but had no practical significance. On 8 June 1956, Pavelic and other Eustace immigrants founded the Croatian Liberation Movement Croatian, Hrvatski Oslobodolatski Pokret or HOP, which aimed to re-establish the Nazism and NDH. The HOP saw itself as a determined adversary of communism, atheism and Yugoslavism in any possible form. On 10 April 1957, the 16th anniversary of the founding of the Nazi independent state of Croatia, Pavelic was grievously wounded in an assassination attempt by the Serbian Blagoj Jovovic, a hotel owner and former Royal Yugoslav officer who had been Montenegrin Chetnik during the war. Jovovic had tried to assassinate Pavelic multiple times, planning it as early as 1946, when he learned Pavelic was in hiding inside the Vatican. Jovovic shot Pavelic in the back and collar bone while the latter was exiting a bus in El Palomar, a Buenos Aires suburb near his home. Pavelic was transferred to the Syrian Lebanese hospital, where his true identity was established. After Perrin's fall from power, Pavelic fell out of favor with the Argentine government. Yugoslavia again requested his extradition. Pavelic refused to stay in hospital, even though a bullet was lodged in his spine. Two weeks after the shooting, as the Argentine authorities agreed to grant the Yugoslav government's extradition request, he moved to Chile. He spent four months in Santiago, and then moved to Spain. Reports circulated that Pavelic had fled to Paraguay to work for the Stroessner regime. His Spanish asylum became known only in late 1959. <laughs> Death in Spain He arrived in Madrid on 29 November 1957. Pavelic continued contacts with members of the Croatian Liberation Movement and received visitors from around the world. Pavelic lived secretly with his family, probably by agreement with the Spanish authorities. Even though he was granted asylum, the Spanish authorities did not allow him public appearances. In the middle of 1958, he sent a message from Madrid to the Assembly of Croatian Societies in Munich. He expressed his wish that all Croats unite with the goal of re-establishing the independent state of Croatia. Some groups distanced themselves from Pavelic and others did so after his death. In his will, he named Stjepan Hefer as his successor as the president of the Croatian Liberation Movement. Pavelic died on 28 December 1959 at the Hospital Aleman in Madrid at the age of 70 from the wounds he sustained from the assassination attempt by Jovovic. He was buried in San Isidro Cemetery, Madrid's oldest private burial ground. In popular culture Harry Turtledove's short story Ready for the Fatherland is set in an alternate history where the independent state of Croatia continues to exist in 1979. Pavelic is revered as the first Poglavnik and his image appears on the state's primary currency, but no further details are shared as to how his life played out in that timeline, which diverged from ours in February 1943. In a 2015 Croatian comedy film National Hero Lili Vidic, Pavelic is portrayed by Drazen Kacek. The movie follows a group of Yugoslav partisans, led by a young poet Lili Vidic, who compete in the NDH's fictional talent show, Factor X whose winner wins the chance to perform at the Pavelic's reception for Hitler. Partisans see it as an opportunity to kill both Hitler and Pavelic, and thus end the World War II. In 2017, the movie was adapted into a theatrical play where Pavelic was portrayed by Boris Murkovi. <laughs> <laughs> 